report. Uh, I know myself and Susan were included, and I found it um, shocking myself that the age was so low at 12 years old, they could basically override their parents' um, desires for them. And uh, I, I don't disagree at all with any of the statements that, that you made. Any other comments from the Board of Health? Oh, Cami, you have your hand up. I do, and I actually don't have any Board of Health member comments today, but um, could we take the formal action of approval of the agenda on the previous item number? There was a motion and a second, but no vote taken. Oh, thank you, Cami. I appreciate that. Sure, sorry to point that out. Keeping me on task. Um, okay, so uh, let's have a vote uh, as far as um, accepting the agenda as presented. We have a uh, Doris made the motion and Dr. Turbush seconded that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Commissioner Bremer, thank you so much for keeping me on task with that. Um, the only comment that I have to make regarding the Board of Health is to uh, I thought initially that we would be meeting all in person. I appreciate the staff being uh, uh, a little forward thinking, not knowing what everybody's weather would be like in their uh, particular area and putting this on teams today. I appreciate that uh, kept everybody safe and from having to get on the road if they didn't otherwise have to. I also wanted to make mention of Susan. Um, she is out of state right now, but for a good reason. She is going to be accepting an award for our El Paso County Board of Health with regard to emergency preparedness. And we're very grateful for that. I think you went to a conference too, Susan. So hopefully we'll hear more about that when uh, the director's report comes around. But um, if we were in person, all of us would be there except for Susan. So that's the reason that I wanted to bring that up. Okay, um, moving on to number four, on our agenda, the approval of the minutes. Hopefully you've had time to review the minutes that have been sent out by the staff. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Turbush. Motion to approve. Second? I second. Yeah. Briggs. Briggs, okay, second. Thank you, General Briggs. All in favor of approving the minutes, let me say, uh, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Any public comment um, from items not on the agenda? I'm not sure how many members of the public we have. We've got 41 people present in our uh, Teams meeting. Do we have any public comment? Hearing none, do we have anyone on staff that um, is aware of whether we do or not? Okay, well, we will move on. But thank you. Let's move on to the finance and budget report. Uh, Samantha Montgomery, Samantha, are you with us? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, Samantha Montmany, Budget Supervisor for Health and Human Services with El Paso County. Um, what you guys are, have on your screen is the current year to date information through the end of March. Um, revenues overall are actually <coughs> coming in slightly above budget. A lot of that again is due to the EPC ARPA that we had to carry over from 2022 being the accounting, um, following our accounting principles. So we're still showing that. Um, also, we're seeing slightly up on our licensees and permits. I think that's a little bit of timing, but we're keeping our eye closely on that one. Um, overall, in our expenditures, we are coming in just below budget with personnel coming in under due to a few vacancies. Operating is showing slightly above current budget, and that's due to a couple one-time expenditures that are hit kind of early in the year. So that should level out as the year continues on. Um, overall, everything, like I said, is coming in around are either above budget with revenues or slightly below with expenditures and we have no concerns. Do you guys have any questions for me today? 
I do not, but I want to uh, make room for Dr. Boo. He usually has uh, questions that I can't think of. Done? Thank you yeah, for the chuckles that I got. I appreciate that. Okay, it looks like uh, I don't see that we need a um, action required on that item. So, Samantha, thank you very much for the presentation and for, again, keeping us on track. We want to make sure that we are always um, being good stewards of the of the funds that we're entrusted with. Item seven on the agenda is a proclamation recognizing National Nurses Week. And it says on my agenda that uh, Kenny Hodges, our county attorney, is going to read that item for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm glad to. Can I jump in now? You betcha, right now. All right, thank you, sir. All right, uh, proclamation of the El Paso County Board of Health recognizing National Nurses Week 2023. Whereas National Nurses Week is celebrated each year between May 6th, National Nurses Day, and May 12th, the birthday of celebrated nurse Florence Nightingale. And whereas National Nurses Week honors the contributions and sacrifices of nurses and serves as a reminder to thank the medical profession professionals who keep individuals and communities healthy. Whereas the theme of National Nurses Week 2023 is you make a difference, honoring nurses as extraordinary individuals who display courage, care, dedication, and commitment in caring for others and the positive impact they have on everyone's lives. And whereas the American Public Health Association defines public health nurse uh, nursing as the practice of promoting and protecting the health of populations using knowledge from nursing, social, and public health sciences. And whereas public health nurses work to promote wellness and help prevent disease, and reduce health risks at the population level through evidence-based care and education. And whereas El Paso County Public Health nurses serve individuals and families across numerous programs and services, including nurse family partnership, immunizations, and travel, tuberculosis, disease prevention, reproductive health, and much more. And whereas in 2022, El Paso County public health nurses provided many critical services, including but not limited to 9,602 immunizations, 1,609 reproductive health visits, 2,314 nurse family partnership home visits, and care for 61 active and latent tuberculosis cases. And whereas the knowledge and skills of public health nurses enable them to make significant contributions to public health through a unique combination of clinical nursing background with knowledge from the public health and social sciences. And whereas it is more important than ever than, I'm sorry, it is more important than ever to celebrate nurses across all fields for their unwavering care and dedication for their patients and communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health, the week of May 6th through 12th, 2023 is proclaimed as National Nurses Week in El Paso County, Colorado. Move seconded and adopted by the El Paso County Board of Health at its meeting held on April 26, 2023 in Colorado Springs, Colorado by President Ted Cullis, uh, attest Secretary Susan Whelan. Uh, thank you very much, Kenny. I appreciate you reading that for us. Uh, let's take a motion and a second, and then we'll take some comments if anybody wishes to comment on that. And uh, Councilmember Donaldson, thank you. I, I see you've joined us. I appreciate you being with us. Yeah, my, my apologies. I've been here uh, almost the whole meeting. My computer wanted me to restart it so that it would be happy to participate. So uh, Understood. a couple, couple minutes late. And I, I'm happy to uh, make a motion to... Um, approve the proclamation of the El Paso County Board of Health recognizing National Nurses Week 2023. Okay, do we have a second? The second. Dora, second. Nope. Okay. Doris can have it. We got a second and a third there. We got uh, Councilman Donaldson, he uh, made the motion and Doris Ralston made the second. All in favor of this, rec this recognition, this proclamation, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
and it passes unanimously. Now, I'd like to open it up for any comments for any of the board members that would like to um, make any statements regarding this recognition. Commissioner Gonzalez, I see your hand up. And thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I too had to log in on issues. Every time I got to do that two person, whatever they call the two mode logging in takes me a long time <laughs> from the house. But uh, no, I just wanted to thank all the staff, all the nurses, uh, you know, that work for the county and then all those, uh, you know, in our community you did great work and uh, we continue to support you and uh, appreciate all the great effort that you do for us. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Well, Ted, I very much thank you to our nurses, nurses of all, all types and specialties. Uh, they actually couldn't do the job without them, and uh, uh, appreciate, particularly in public health, their leadership uh, roles. And many of them function uh, independently without any um, uh, immediate. Uh, uh, they, they're, they're outside the clinical setting, so community health nurses are particularly important. That's all. Okay. All right. Well, I also want to uh, chime in and say thank you to our public health nurses and really to everyone that's in that profession. Um, it, it's one thing to say thank you and uh, and appreciate the work that they do it's uh, it's more meaningful when you've been on the receiving end of a nurse's great care and i have been unfortunate enough i guess in my life to have been on the receiving end of some really fantastic care from nurses and they made a difference in my life they made a difference in my attitude in my my mental well-being as i was recovering from an injury and so for all of the nurses, all of those that, that take on that responsibility, uh, I'm very, very appreciative and thank you. You deserve this recognition. And I see that um, our uh, Susan has her hand up. Let's uh, let's go to Susan. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask all of the nurses on the call if if they could turn on their cameras. And I also wanted to echo echo the sentiments that. Um, our nursing staff, they are essential to the work of public health. We have clinical nurses in uh, areas of immunization, um, tuberculosis, our reproductive health clinics, and then also more population-based and nurse family partnership that, that meets people, um, moms, you know, where they are, whether it's in the community or at their homes. Um, we have mobile vaccination uh, clinics. And so we we uh, rely heavily on on our nurses to um, reach all areas of of our county um, with the services that we provide, and ultimately um, providing um, efforts towards <laughs> overall community health. And so nurses uh, today are recognized, and, and every day uh, we value the work that they that they. Um, that they do. And I also just wanted to make a special note and recognition to Deanne Ryberg, who is uh, my deputy director, and she is a nurse as well. And I think that um, her her leadership um, with our agency has has been outstanding. And so wanted to to note that as well, that, that they are essential to the work that we do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we did have a motion by Councilman Donaldson and a second by Doris to uh, pass this proclamation. Have we voted already? I don't think so. Did we did? Cammy said no. Well, let's vote again. Yeah, okay. you voted before. We, we did. Speaking. Okay, we did. We did. Great. Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate the work of our nurses and. I think Susan kind of hit it when she said that we recognize them today, but we appreciate them every day. And uh, uh, that's certainly the truth. We, we appreciate the work that they do. Now we're going into the director's report. So it's uh, our director, Susan Whelan. It is your show. Your microphone's off, Susan. Thank you. I have a few updates under my my report. 
um, to provide and, and others that, that will um, provide presentations. I first wanted to start off, start off and, and say that um, I am at a emergency preparedness and response conference that is put on by the National Association of City and County Health Officials, as well as over the weekend um, attended a health disparities conference and, and meeting with others um, throughout public health and CDC and um, NACHO um, on, on the work that, that we're doing and, and sharing um, best practices and, and areas of, of challenge. We attended an award ceremony last night to be recognized on behalf of our Board of Health and our agency and our um, emergency preparedness and response team, which we have seven members, um, six of them attended and one of them is, is uh, stayed back in El Paso County to, to ensure if there was any um, emergencies that, that we have a, a point person there and that we work very closely with the Office of Emergency Management um, of the Pikes Peak region. Our agency has been recognized since the early 2000s with numerous project public health ready um, uh, recognitions and, and status. And what that means, the best, the best way that I can explain it is that our agency, um, we, we uh, strive for excellence and we meet a certain criteria that is much like accreditation a process where you have to demonstrate and cross rock um, how prepared you are with uh, not, only, not only preparedness efforts, but response efforts for all hazards, um, planning, exercises, functional, full scale, uh, tabletops, um, all of those areas. And we have an outstanding emergency preparedness and response team who currently uh, take care of a five county region, which includes El Paso County. And so that's, that's quite the designation for um, El Paso County, Colorado. There's only a little bit over 500 health departments out of the 3000 that um, have this designation. And so there was um, a celebration last night and I'm um, happy that I was able to participate. Um, they did a great job of providing some scholarships for, for some of us to attend. I also want to note that our um, emergency preparedness and response program manager, Janelle McNair, uh, presented yesterday a best practice on um, onboarding. And uh, it was standing room only. People were uh, outside of the door trying to listen in and she, uh, talked about how do you onboard employees? You know, how do you make a good first impression? How do you set them up for the first um, one week, um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and had um, all of it laid out as we are responsible for training our staff on the National Incident Management System, as well as the Incident Command System. And uh, folks were very engaged and she did a phenomenal job representing El Paso County and um, the, the uh, excellent work and, and best practices that, that we have developed and we um, employ. If you can go on to the next slide of, actually, can we go to the, um, the financial awards that we have received, please? We, we just received word that um, we were recognized um, for our uh, financial management practices. And you'll see up on the slide that um, one of the uh, areas was a certificate of achievement of, for excellence in financial reporting for the 2021 annual comprehensive financial report. And then the other one was for outstanding achievement in popular annual financial reporting for the 2021 popular annual report. These are significant. Not many public health agencies receive these. And um, it takes a <laughs> tremendous amount of effort as it relates to uh, submitting and demonstrating the, the excellence with our finance and our budget teams with the county. And then also everyone on my staff who oversees a budget and adheres to um, practices that, that uh, we have in place for um, financial management. And so we just got word last week that, that we received these, these awards. And so this is significant that um, our agency for uh, four straight years 
um, has received uh, excellence in uh, financial and, and, and budgeting practices. So wanted to congratulate the entire team, um, including county budget and, and finance office and, and my staff. Now, if we can move on to the uh, community health assessment update with Carolyn Gary. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Gary is um, our development officer and Carolyn, I'll ask you to uh, present an update. If you remember board members, we had a, uh, a 101 board of health session, which we spent a few hours and this was a topic of the conversation as this is a significant effort by our agency. We are statutorily responsible for every five years developing a community health assessment and then going on to develop a community health improvement plan with the community. And so it's not solely the health departments, but we provide the leadership to um, complete the assessment as well as the um, community health improvement plan. And so Carolyn, if you could um, provide an update, please. Hello everybody and good morning. Um, this is an update in terms of where we are with the process with the Colorado Health Assessment. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, um, you will see that this is really um, an eight phase coordinated process that starts, of course, with planning the process and leads through various aspects. A key component of this is the uh, direct engagement with the community. So phase six is what's highlighted right now. And this is exactly where we are right now with the process. We're developing the plan. We're working on reviewing multiple data sets in terms of uh, the various uh, areas that have been highlighted. Um, a key component of this is the engagement um, with the uh, Healthy Communities Collaborative. Um, and this is representative of 60 uh, partnering agencies and groups that represent our community. And it's their input and their engagement that really feeds how these areas are prioritized. Um, and so with this, we're, we're working right now on the plan development. If we could go to the next slide, uh, the result of this will be our community health assessment, which will uh, be representative of the data within our community, as well as those prioritized areas. If you recall from the education session uh, that you engaged with, uh, with the board, with our um, health planner, Megan uh, Haynes, who's leading this effort, uh, she reviewed some of these data sets that were highlighted in one of the key areas um, that has been identified um, as leading health issues uh, includes suicide as well as access to care. Um, there are other areas as well um, that have been identified, but those two primary areas, um, those are areas of focus that will really then drive our, uh, how we want to look at resources within the community, how we want to partner effectively within the community, especially as it relates to those leading health issues. The other issues um, that were also identified include uh, school safety, child and abuse related injury, drug overdose, as well as homelessness. Um, so the content for our community health assessment will include a, an overview, background information about the process, the methodology uh, that was utilized to create the report, as well as related data indicators and supporting resources and information. Next slide. Then um, this will then feed the development of our community health improvement plan, which is our CHIP, which is really our roadmap. And typically, you know, this is a five-year process. And so we're right at that point of developing our next CHIP that will take us through for the next five years. And this is rooted uh, with the data sets that have been analyzed as part of the community health assessment. And again, this will really be uh, our roadmap and our guide in terms of how we're going to partner uh, within the community related to the health issues that have been identified as part of this whole health assessment process. Next slide. Okay, and so that then leads us into the next piece, which is our partner engagement grants, but I want to pause here 
and Susan and see if there's uh, any questions at this point. Are there okay. any questions about what's been presented prior to moving to a partner engagement grants? I think Dr. Brew has a question. Hi, Dr. Gary, thank you for uh, the presentation. You know, this comes up a couple of times already during our meeting today, and this has been on my mind the past couple of months. So teen suicide, uh, the last two months or so, I understand that in our practice, we have two successful completed teen suicides. So that's been on my mind. I've been ta talking about uh, some, some of that uh, among our, uh, the people in our practice. And I recently made an argument without really knowing any data that uh, if uh, our teenagers spend more time with family, specifically with parents, then I think, but I do not know, I think that mental health issues among teenagers might be less. So I made that argument, but based only what I think and how I argue the pros and cons in my mind. So my question to you is, do you know if there's any data correlating time spent with families, such as dinner time together, specifically time spent with parents, uh, correlation of that uh, with um, risk of mental health issues? So right Carolyn, now, do you want me to take that or okay, go ahead? Yeah, no, you go ahead and then I can I can follow up because I know right now um, there is a third of thorough data analysis in process um, as part of the health assessment. And uh, we're actually looking at multiple data sets around these health issues. Um, but Susan, do you want to jump in on that as well? Yes, yeah, so I mean, as, as part of the community health um, improvement plan, we will have strategies as it relates to um, some of the, the issues and, and the data that is brought forth. And what's going to be different um, about this year's community health assessment and the community health improvement plan um, will be all ages. Um, the suicide that, that we will focus on previously in 2014, when we uh, were put on the map, um, I should say Colorado Springs is, is having um, one of the highest uh, suicide rates among teenagers, um, 17 years of age and, and younger. Um, that's when we developed the um, teen suicide prevention efforts and we can need to continue uh, keeping up the momentum. But Dr. Vu, to your question, as it relates to um, um, spending more time with, with family. Um, in general, what we do know um, when we decrease uh, risk factors um, and increase the protective factors such as um, connectedness. And so connectedness uh, could be with a trusted adult. Um, that could be a family member or someone outside of the home. We do know that um, not only in, in suicide prevention, but other areas of um, you know, whether it's, it's violence prevention to self or to others, um, that uh, the connectedness is extremely important. Um, and so we, we can dive into to some of that, but um, that is something that, that we work on with, with our par partners and, and our youth as it relates to um, having kids connected to the community, having safe spaces. <laughs> um, so it, it um, is an effective strategy um, to have a, a trusted adult um, and to increase those those connections, um, so that that's um, that's an area that we will expand upon, and hopefully that that is helpful to addressing your specific question. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Gary. I, so that that is very helpful, and uh, yes, connectiveness. I I have not thought about that concept. Connectiveness. It, it does make sense. But to General Briggs' point earlier, and in my mind still, I feel, although I do not know, that there is a difference between connectiveness to peers, connectiveness to other adults, versus connectiveness to the core family members, and specifically connectiveness to parents. Uh, so, but that's only my feeling. Um, 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 so thank you. <laughs> and I see that uh, Dr. Turbush has his hand up. 
Well, uh, General Briggs is before me. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Jeberson. I would like to uh, to follow up on what uh, Dr. Vu just said. It it's uh, certainly important for uh, children and and young adults to get connections in the community, but n I do not believe at the uh, exclusion of their parents. When uh, uh, when you have somebody that will sort of come into a person's life for a shorter amount of time than the experience that they will have with their own family. Um, and then that family unaware that they have another adult uh, inside that loop, uh, that, that can be destructive. So, uh, because now you have conflict within the child about who should they be listening to. And so that's my concern is that that we, we are using the idea of connectedness and reducing the idea of family in that uh, and trying to equate those things. And I would uh, I would agree with Dr. Vu that there is something different about family. Thank you. Thank you. And Anna. I did want to clarify. I, I, I want to clarify that I'm not saying that um, we're not promoting to have a trusted adult other than family. I mean, family is core, uh, but I think it's important for the teenagers to have uh, connected this to to family, and if it's not family, then that there has to be someone that a trusted adult. So I, I wanted to make sure that I'm not. It's public health. We're not trying to promote um, connectedness or having that trusted adult outside of the family. But all families are set up very differently, or uh, experience uh, just just different dynamics. And so I think that at the core is you know having a trusted adult, someone that you can count on. Um, and uh, uh, just feel connected. And we can, we can expand upon that at a later time. We are planning to um, launch a uh, suicide uh, visualization uh, data dashboard uh, with information and strategies, but that will go along um, with the community health assessment in the future. And uh, we can drill down on um, effective strategies and, and, and really what are we, are we talking about there? So. Uh, families families can um, have that information, and we do have uh, information for families that was that were created by parents on our website um, as it relates to teen suicide prevention. So they put uh, information together in a in a resource guide. Uh, so in our teen suicide prevention work group, we have um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, partnerships as well as people with lived experience. Um, and also parents that that uh, participate within our our per suicide prevention work. Thank you, Susan. We've got a couple of other hands up. I don't know who was first, Dr. Kerbush or Councilman Donaldson. Oh, I'll go quick. Um, Dr. Boo, while you were speaking, I did a very quick internet search and uh, I sent an article, I, I just sent it to Susan, maybe she could distribute it to the other board of health members, but the significant increase uh, in single parent families versus two parent families in teen suicide. In fact, the, the uh, significant increase is all causes mortality are higher in single parent versus two parent families. So I don't know if you can extrapolate uh, from that, but there's a data point. Thank you, Dr. Turbush. Uh, Councilman Donaldson. Um, yeah, thank you, Ted. And you know, my request or or um, comment would be that you know, on Colorado Springs City Council, we just had an election. We have four new um, council members, one of whom has a real interest in uh, kind of highlighting mental health. I think particularly suicide. And there have been a few comments made which were very broad that El Paso County is the worst or in last place. I would appreciate if as long as this is uh, the rest of the board thinks this is um, useful, maybe a presentation in the next month or two on mental health or especially suicide in the county overall, not just uh, teenagers. And if we could with a comparison to other, you know, similar cities, I believe altitude has something to do. We don't know why, but but people who live at altitude have a higher 
uh, suicide rate, the military installation here. Is that something that, that we, we could do or, or uh, do others think that would be useful? Well, I for one think it would be useful and uh, I'd like to see that as well. I see a thumbs up from General Briggs. Susan, is that something that staff can provide? Yes, and, and we would be happy to do so. We, you know, as part of the community health assessment and all of the data points in there, um, I do plan to um, provide a presentation at the next Board of Health meeting as it relates to, to opioids and then uh, filter out fentanyl because we, we are also working on a data dashboard visualization of opioids and the impacts in El Paso County and, and others in comparisons. <laughs> but we also are working on um, a suicide uh, dashboard as well to um, you know, have unfiltered information. And I think to your point, um, uh, Councilman uh, Donaldson, is that, you know, sometimes you hear things in the news or various different places. And mm -hmm. what we would like to do is provide unfiltered information on data. And then also we, we have a strong partnership with our uh, coroner's office, uh, Dr. Kelly, as well as um, Dr. Um, Russell, Emily Russell. And so this is something that we would be, um, interested in doing and so next month is um is may so i i would probably uh go for june or 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 may if, if that's doable okay i believe next month is uh, mental health month uh, and uh so whenever is is uh doable but it's kind of what you're getting at it's I think it's useful to have a refresh on the facts versus just bold, you know, broad statements were the worst. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. And, uh, and, Councilman Donaldson. I yeah. appreciate that because I very acutely remember 2014. And what can often happen is that 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 sticks in people's minds and they think that, oh, we were worse. We were the worst then. We must still be the worst. And I would like to see how things have transitioned since that point. So, Susan, uh, whenever you could get that together, I, I would appreciate it as well. And yeah, I, I'll um, we'll, we'll get to that together quickly. We we have the data, we have the information, and 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 we can pull that together. I, I did want to emphasize what you bro both brought up is that there's a tremendous amount of work that is going on in the community as it relates to all ages suicide prevention, and all of the efforts are making a difference. You know, do we still have um, uh, suicides and is it, a, is, is it a problem? Yes. Um, however, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, strengths to look out, you know, as a, as a county and as a, um, the various cities. So I, I do wanna point that out because a, a lot of times we jump to, you know, the worst, you know, here's the problem, but also we can't forget um, all of the good work and, and the passion with a purpose that's going into to this and acknowledge that work because it's heavy work and there are people that are making a difference. And so I, I did want to acknowledge that. And I'm not sure if there's another hand up or if it's um, Commissioner Gonzalez's from previously. I know, I thought mine was down. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and Thank you, uh, Dr. Gary, for that update on the community health assessment. I also wanted to mention that it is a tremendous effort internally and externally as it relates to coordination. And Dr. Um, Bernadette Albanese has been providing uh, significant leadership in this area as she is one of her areas of um, expertise is um, data translation. And uh, thank you, Dr. Turbush, for, 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 for providing that, that additional uh, data source and we are going through numerous data data sources um, so wanted to to acknowledge that now we have um, our grants coordinator uh, Jordan Linder um, who's going to present the a concept follow-up that we presented uh, previously as it relates to our um, public health infrastructure uh, grant that we received uh, for five years nearly uh, eight million dollars and this is part of that to strengthen uh, partnerships in the community and she's going to go over some details so Jordan thank you Susan good morning everyone um, you can go to the next slide Kelsey uh, so just a refresher here this is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention grant we received um, back in December and it's for strengthening public health infrastructure workforce and data systems 
Um, so there was two strategies of this funding. The first strategy is the overall workforce and um, pouring in funding into our personnel, professional development, and any needs that we see to build up retention um, with our workforce. And so that funding extends for five years, and that's $7.3 million. And then there was also a second strategy, foundational cap capabilities of public health. And that funding is set to be expended within one year. So we have this funding um, ending November 30th of 2023 this year. So we have kind of a shorter runway to utilize that fund, but we're excited to process this partner engagement grant and funnel that money into the community and then strategically improve our partnerships and improve the public health structure as a whole. And so the total amount we're working with there is $452,199. You can go to the next slide. And so with the strategy to the foundational capabilities, you know, this image comes from, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Public Health Accreditation Board. And so we're focusing in on that circle there, the community partnership development. And on um, the right side of the slide, these activities, this community partnership development, came directly from the CDC and their identified um, example activities that we could use this strategy to funding for. So really to build up systems and processes to collaborate with community organizations doing behavioral health work and just really um, being able to serve our community to the best we can as a entire um, system. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so here you can see the alignment of how we're deriving like this exciting opportunity to um, fund community partners in the well in El Paso County is um, in that blue square focusing on that strategy to really strengthening community partnership development engagement also which aligns with uh, the public health accreditation board as well as our current um, El Paso County public health strategic plan as well as the county's objective to really build out the health and safety of our community to develop partnerships to support the community efforts to improve that. Um, so I thought that was a nice visual to hopefully tie everything in together and then we'll go to the next slide kind of the exciting part. So throughout our process uh, we launched um, a grant application that was open to nonprofit organizations who are focusing on improving a collaborative process with behavioral health partners and services or, or, or organizations connecting communities to services as like a navigation piece. And so those were our two areas of focus for when we were reviewing applications. So the application opened March 6th. It was open for two weeks. We received 43 um, applications from various El Paso County community organizations and of those applications a total of 1.37 million dollars were requested in funding. We had exactly three hundred and twenty four thousand dollars to um, allocate out an award and so that narrowed it down to awarding 10 community organizations um, and we did we had an evaluation team we created an evaluation team, <coughs> rubric we had five internal um, staff members who evaluated the applications and we went ahead and notified um, the organizations that were awarded and those that were not on April 7th. And, and so we're ready to launch um, kind of what we're calling this cohort model of these 10 organizations to come together. We'll have a orientation kickoff meeting and really have some strong touch points with these 10 organizations to see where there's gaps in either our our um, partnering or gaps in the community, how we can better serve, how we can work together. Um, uh, I can address your comment or question now. I have a question. This is Doris. Um, what are yes. the 10, um, who are the 10 grantees? What organizations are they? Sure. Um, and Kelsey, if you want to go to the next slide real quick, we have a breakout of what the funding kind of ended up spreading out to be with these focused service areas of behavioral um, health support, resource navigation, access to healthy food, and other public system services. So that's how the 10 organizations are kind of spread out. 
And we will be going live on our website just as this is federal dollars to make public of those who are awarded. And so those organizations are the Centro de La Familia, Family Promise of Colorado Springs, Homefront Military Network, Hope Mountain Behavioral Health, Mindfulness and Positivity Project, New Directions Agape Services, Pikes Peak United Way, Project Angel Heart, Status Code 4 Incorporated, Trails and Open Space Coalition. And um, I just, I'll just make note that we did mirror the El Paso County ARPA Community Impact Grant process. We were obviously working with a lot smaller um, amount of funding. So the max funding an organization will receive is $36,000 to spend by November 30th of 2023. And so that mirrored um, their grant process. We were able to really collaborate with those core um, East Central members of that ARPA Community Impact Grant to make sure our process was mirroring that of um, their how they un, how they notified the community of the opportunity, how they awarded, how they reviewed all the applications, and how they're also how I will be looking at the risk assessments and how we'll be incorporating um, just the legality pieces of the service agreement to um, award these organizations. And is there one Looks more like slide? We've got a couple of hands up, um, okay. Jordan. And sure. Who was first? I I think, think. Yeah, Donaldson was. Yeah, Jordan, um, mm -hmm. one of your first slides showed the two uh, grant amounts. One was, yeah. I think, seven million. The other was, I thought it was closer to 450,000. But here it looks like uh, we're, I think you mentioned we have 324. I'm just wondering what the difference. Oh, yeah, so um, so why is. we spread that out. So we also have um, a consultant we'll be working with to really highlight and help us gather the information and data and help these organizations work towards measurable outcomes. So we're paying that consultant a portion of the $452,000. And then there was also some program fees and professional development funding set aside. So program, um, I guess the expenses was set aside for our current community navigators and the work they're currently doing in the community. So we set some funds aside for their current work. They're really working closely with the Pikes Peak Library and providing services for those constituents and then also um, funding for professional development for our internal community navigators, as well as ideally with this cohort model, we'll see what gaps are needed and hopefully be able to fund some professional development for these organizations as they see. And that can be, and Susan and I have discussed um, potentially having like a grant workshop and bringing in even those other um, 32 organizations who applied um, to really help our community build out those robust skills to um, be confident and um, be, uh, submit quality applications for future grants, whether that's ours or private organization grants. The, uh, the maybe one or two more little follow-up questions and I'll be done. Mm -hmm. the, the piece that's going to the library, Pikes Peak Library District, is that to work with the homeless? Is that what that is for? Um, it, yes, it's for um, the homeless, but I don't think it's um, closed at that level. I think it's for those seeking out resources that need, whether that's, um, yeah, uh, okay. like amenities, um, just essential pieces that individuals might need for the time being. Okay, it's interesting. I think, I think, I think uh, Jack Briggs has some thoughts on on how effective that really is but mm -hmm. uh will we be able to see a, a complete breakout of the four hundred and fifty thousand and you know sure. line by line where it all went to okay thank you yeah i, I, I would like that yeah we can send that out and uh councilman uh, donaldson i i did want to um let uh our, our board members know that this is an innovative uh practice we have not um, provided a uh, um, an opportunity to try to strengthen the public health system in a way that um, funds partners because we we haven't had funding and um, through the CDC grant they um, 
believe that what we present to them is an innovative practice that they further want to evaluate. And that's why we are having an evaluator also um, with this first, uh, the 10 cohort to see the effectiveness. And so we will be back from time to time with the board to um, provide information on return on investment as it relates to community health. And I will note that everything that, um, you know, all of these grants or the, the awardees, it was all in line with our um, community health assessment opponents and where we think we're going with the community health improvement plan around uh, behavior health and, and access to care. And so we'll, as we have more board meetings and, and uh, more information to share, it will narrow in on um, more specifics around uh, what we're trying to accomplish along with an evaluation um, of how the money is being spent and, and is it making a difference? And so I did want to um, provide that background. Uh, General Briggs. <clears throat> um, maybe just to echo what uh, Councilman Donald, uh, Donaldson said there is, uh, I, would, uh, I, I believe we should be seeing a line by line breakdown of uh, how the, the funding is being, or the grant is being awarded uh, to include administrative costs. And then to tie in what Director Whelan just said, uh, uh, it, it would be useful to see what the outcomes for each organization and each line uh, is attempting to achieve. Now, does that have to be perfect? No, uh, we, you know, we have outcomes that we attempt to achieve and, and we strive for them, but, uh, but having those, those two things will give us the opportunity to have oversight on uh, where this might be going, because this is a powerful opportunity, and we just want to make sure that we provide our uh, our responsibility of due diligence as a board. Thank you. And if I can jump in on that, uh, General Briggs, I appreciate that. Um, it's not, and Jordan, please hear this, it's not a questioning of what you're doing. What it is, is bringing us to a full level of awareness so that we can speak intelligently about where the grants have gone, uh, who was granted the money and what the money is being used for. So um, please hear that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Jordan, well, I'd can... just like to say great work and thank you for the work that you've done in a very short time it, and it's very comprehensive mm -hmm. and the report is too, so thank you. We can go to the last slide real quick. So, so really what we're looking forward to is what's next. Um, we do want to, as you know, the development office with you know, Susan's leadership is really to continue to look for funding that we will be able to continue a program like this and continue that innovative approach to build out the public health system. And so that is, you know, we're hoping that these 43 organizations, the 33 that were not funded, that we can continue this um, model and provide more opportunities. And so that's, that's the goal, that's the future. And we'd really like to keep engaged with those community partners that were um, excited about the opportunity. And so we're working closely with the CDC. This strategy two funding is only set for, you know, 12 months, but they know that people want to know if it's going to be extended or what that will look like as it um, progresses. So I know they're working hard to identify with the needs and how they're going to expand that strategy too. So we're looking forward to that. And yes, we plan to touch base throughout this kind of life, life cycle of this grant um, with those measured outcomes collecting that data and really just understanding how we can strategically partner in the community. So we're, we will definitely be in touch more often, more frequently, and we're excited for these um, organizations to also hopefully present their ideas and present their outcomes um, together with us. And Jordan, so I'm gonna jump in um, just really quickly and, and just add that a key um, aspect of this is also to work side by side with these organizations, looking at sustainability, looking at the long view as well, um, especially within our community. This is one of the things too that the CDC is very focused on and they are assembling resources nationally to figure that out. Oftentimes a lot of these efforts are highly dependent upon grant funds and so we understand that the impact is there um, and we're going to be working closely as part of measuring these activities to figure out what that sustainability um, can look like as a collaborative effort. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate the uh, information, the presentation, and uh, we look forward to hearing all of the good work that this money is going to um, and 
uh, I think Jack uh, Briggs said it well that um, we know that we set goals. We don't always reach those goals, but that means that we're working in a, in a positive direction to get some things done in our community and we're grateful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. All right. Thank you, so, Jordan. Uh, and I, I have um, one more topic to, to bring up and um, that's the topic of fentanyl and specifically um, xylazine and uh, fentanyl. I have Dr. Paul Mayer, who is one of our, our co-medical directors and since this has been a hot topic, um, wanted to bring it uh, before you to have some unfiltered information. And I do know that um, we worked with the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to put out a health alert network to the medical community um, on this topic and wanted to provide some, some information and give an opportunity to do a QA and a um, as well. So Dr. Mayer, if you could provide an update, please. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I just wanted to make you aware of a new sad development in uh, opioid abuse. Uh, xylazine is a veterinary medicine used as a tranquilizer. It's actually similar to one of our blood pressure medicines, clonidine. Um, and the way in which it induces a coma is actually not completely understood. The thing that's unfortunate is that it's um, some of its effects add to the effects of opioids, decreasing heart rate, decreasing respiration rate and inducing coma, and so they tend to make uh, opioids, fentanyl in particular, more lethal. The people who abuse opioids uh, want this effect because it seems to prolong the effect of the opioids of feeling altered um, is extended by the xylazine. Um, it, uh, some of its other effects are unfortunate, can cause very intense, what's called vasoconstriction or narrowing of the arteries, and that can cause uh, tissue necrosis, death of tissue, and even lead to amputations, which is uh, very unfortunate. One other concerning thing about this medication is it's not reversed by Narcan. Now, in a, in a situation where somebody encounters somebody who has overdosed, we still strongly recommend the use of Narcan. If you look at uh, xylazine associated overdose deaths, I believe it, some statistic would say about 98% of those also involve fentanyl and the Narcan can reverse the fentanyl component of their overdose, hopefully lighten them up a little bit so that uh, they can start breathing again and get EMS there in time. Um, but the, as a direct effect, Narcan does not help with the xylazine component of the overdose, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, I did reach out to Dr. Leon Kelly, our uh, county coroner, and as of about a week and a half ago, we don't have any confirmed overdose deaths that involve xylazine, although he had one tox report that was pending. Um, there's a national concern, um, up to about 22% of fentanyl that's been seized has been laced with xylazine. So it's, it's coming, unfortunately, and is a very sad development. And so we really just wanted you to be aware of it. You may hear that name, and we wanted you all to sort of know about the medication. And then, of course, any questions you all have. Dr. Meyer, you mentioned that the um, xylazine doesn't react to Narcan. Uh, right. In the clinical setting, is there something that can be given? Um, when a no, I looked into that. Hospital? Since it's a veterinary medicine, there's no human literature, but I looked into that a fair amount. And in the veterinary literature, there is uh, yohimbine. There are some substances, but they're not really used in humans. So we don't have a reversing agent. And again, in the veterinary world, there are some medications that are used as a reversal agent when it's used as a uh, tranquilizer for veterinary procedures, but those aren't used in humans, unfortunately. Thank you. General Briggs. Yeah, j just for everybody's edification. So we're hearing clients talk about this, but of course they don't use the technical term. It's prank is yeah, the, prank. Uh, is is the term that uh, that's on the street and that's uh it started in the east coast and has has slowly moved its way this way could you say that again it, you kind of cut out what's it called prank prank uh prank for tranquilizer trank trank, right. okay. trank. trank. yeah tranquilizer So are they getting it from, are they stealing it? I mean, where is it coming from? Other countries? I'm just curious on how they're getting this. No, it's being knows. laced into the fentanyl that they're getting. So as they're buying their fentanyl, which is, as you know, manufactured largely overseas, actually, this is being laced into it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. 
Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Dr. Mayor, thank you. I appreciate that. And also wanted to um, make note that we started a, um, a quarterly publication on opioids. You all should have received um, this publication from our, uh, it's, it's called a, a data brief. And we've been working with uh, many of our county partners and it's on our website as well. Um, but getting to the point where we want to have unfiltered information coming directly from um, public health in the county. We have worked with Dr. Kelly, um, District Attorney Michael Allen, the Executive Director of the Department of Human Services, uh, Stacey Kuick, um, the, uh, Sheriff Royball. Um, there's, there's a number of different um, county leadership as well as public information officers. And we also broke out a, uh, uh, a data group that is working on, on data dashboards to, to assist with this. And so we did, did send out our first quarterly publication. It has the basics of opioids. Um, you know, we are getting some questions around folks that are not familiar with fentanyl. Do I need to worry if I'm purchasing uh, Skittles at the store? You know, is there a concern for fentanyl in it? And so there are some really basic questions um, that, that are being asked. So we started with the basics of opioids um, in that publication. And then we will, uh, every quarter, we will uh, share additional information um, to help people have easy, accessible information and, and unfiltered information all in, on, all in one data brief. And so that's currently up on our, our website. And then we will further um, expand upon data visualization as it relates to opioids in our county and comparisons in Colorado. And, um, and then we talked about before too, su suicide prevention and, and information, but wanted to make note of that. And I hope you all received that um, through your email. Um, if, if you did, uh, maybe please shake, shake your head up and down, <laughs> or if not, then we need to resend that. I'd appreciate if you resent it, Susan. I think uh, okay. I can speak for a lot of the board members that we get a lot of emails, and if it's not identified as such, <clears throat> we get a lot of emails uh, that are going to the county that um, that really aren't pertinent to us. So um, if, I, if you identify it to us, then I'm sure that we'll open it and make sure that we read it. I'll make sure to get that out today. And, and Dr. Susan, Meyer, looks like you have your hand up. Susan, this is Glant. Um, the, my email was finally fixed yesterday. Your associate worked with my town manager to get it opened up, so I did not receive it. Thank you, Mayor. And then, uh, thank you very much. I just want, on an unrelated topic, wanted to address Dr. Turbush's comments uh, at the beginning of the meeting that um, I wanted to let him know that both Dr. Albanese and myself do reach out to the CU School of Medicine and we do have been teaching or co-teaching some courses just to try to give a face to public health to the new students because we are aware of that issue. So I just want to let him know that we're both working as much as we can to put a face to public health to those students. There you go. Well, thank you. Thanks. That's a, a, a very encouraging and yeah, uh, uh, more uh, is better. So thank you for what you're doing already. I would particularly like to get a dose of public health injected at the UCCS. And so I'm working with the School of Public, uh, excuse me, College of New College of Public Service, uh, Jack Reed, to try and, and George do Reed. that. But as you know, the curriculum is... Uh, 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 so full, it's hard to hard to inject new uh, new courses and new classes. But thank you for what you're doing. And and you may know that Dan Ryberg is working very actively on that, um, getting some public health exposure with those folks as well. Just so you know, all 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 forces on all sides. Good, thank you. Susan, does that um, your direct report? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, I just wanna make a comment uh, about your director's report. I continue to marvel at the scope and breadth of the work that is being done by uh, people in public health. It's just amazing. You're doing great work in the community. Your, your teams are, uh, they're on point. They know what they're doing and they're working really hard and um, makes all of us look good. Uh, but uh, to some of the discussion earlier, the more information that we have on some of these issues that we that may come up in conversation for the board members, 
the better. We want to be able to support the work that you're doing. And if we can get some of that background, that'd be wonderful for us. So thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it. Um, I think I'm, I for one, am looking forward to the community health assessment coming out and being able to uh, look over that and kind of plot out what we are, where we're going in the next five years so that again, we can be um, supportive of all of the staff efforts going that way. So any other comments from Board of Health members? Seeing none, no hands up. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. Oh, I do want to did want to mention one other thing. I get the opportunity coming up on Wednesday, the third, to speak at Susan's town hall meeting and to uh, let people kind of get to know me. And if any of our members of the uh, the board have not had an opportunity to go to one of the town hall meetings to make your face and presence known to the staff, I would encourage you to get in touch with Susan and get on the agenda just so that you can do just that. Um, I think that it, it's encouraging for the staff to know our level of involvement and um, that we care and appreciate them and for them to know where we're coming from and what our background is. So um, I'm looking forward to coming up on Wednesday and go ahead, Susan. And and I, I wanted to echo that as well. And, and uh, a number of board members have attended, but if you have not, uh, we can accommodate you through uh, remote uh, access or, you know, in person is is uh, is better. Doris uh, joined us last time and she also provided a lot of goodies in the break room for for all staff and um, that really brightened a lot of spirits. And so I wanted to thank um, Doris and I know that you've been a few times, uh, Mr. Cole, uh, Ted and, and Dr. Terbush. And, and so that really means a lot to um, our entire team, town halls, um, we have three different locations and it's an all staff meeting that we provide updates and, and they love, love, love to see um, and hear from board members. So thank you for that, Ted. You're welcome and thanks a lot, Doris. Now I've got to bring snacks. You, you set the bar pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I'll entertain a motion to um, adjourn this Board of Health meeting. Or we could just keep hanging so out. <laughs> Second. Okay, Doris made the motion. Second. Second. I think it was uh, Councilman Donaldson made the second. All right. Will. <laughs> oh, Dr. Turbush. All in favor of adjournment of this meeting, say aye. 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 All right, all. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much for everything you. you do. Ted. Okay. Thanks, before you jump. thanks, Ted. Great, great meeting. Yep, I Thank you. This is Jack. Can I just give you a quick phone call? If you could give me a phone number to call.